This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're here in Honolulu. I'm Jay Fidel. This is, uh, I guess it's a Monday, Think Tech Asia. Exciting. And we have, as we usually do at 4 p.m. on Mondays, we have Russell Yu. And he's, he's in China. He joins us from yet another coffee shop in China. He's making the rounds of all the coffee shops in China, one by one. Uh, Russell is an American lawyer practicing in Beijing and sort of discovering China step by step. Welcome back to the show, Russell. Welcome back, Jay. Yeah. I've been discovering China for 15 years. <laughs> you must and have found out a Jay few things way. by now. <laughs> well, you know, Jay, everybody asks, says, Russell, you must be an expert in China. And I say, no, you're wrong. I'm never an expert because it changes every minute, every second, every day in China. Fantastic changes. And I tell people, if somebody tells you they're a China expert, turn the other way and run away because they're not an expert. Nobody's an expert. <laughs> So um, let, me, let me get the handle on this. Uh, today is uh, December 11th. Um, I guess it's December 12th in China, huh? Um, and we're yes. going to study winter. We're going to study winter in Beijing. So what is it like on December 12th in Beijing in China right now? Well, you know, it, Jay, it's been a really nice, clear, sunny day. So although the winter's cold, it's about 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. It's a little bit chilly. I have to wear a thick down jacket. But for the most part, this year, unlike the previous years, I'm not really carrying my mask. You know, we usually carry a mask, uh, which will prevent uh, small particles, micron-sized particles, from coming through the air and getting through our lungs. It can cause a lot of major heart respiratory diseases and ailments. Now, we've seen that. Big change. So, you know, what strikes me, though, is that, um, you know, we've heard about pollution in Beijing. Um, in fact, uh, we, we, we had on the show a, a couple of years ago a fellow uh, who runs. He likes to run. Um, and he runs in Beijing, but there comes a time in the year where he really cannot run. I, now, I thought that was during the warmer months, but you're here to tell us that during the colder months it gets it gets more polluted than it does in the warmer months. Can you explain that? Well, there's a, a combination of factors, Jay, historically. First of all, you have to understand Beijing is not located next to the ocean. It's not like Shanghai. It's not like Tianjin, where, Tianjin, where the air by the ocean blows it all away. Like in Hawaii, the air blows all the bad stuff away. Beijing is located in the interior, uh, hinterland of China where the air gets trapped. So winter, the air gets heavy, it gets cold. And second of all, China has been for a number of years, uh, uh, been one of the major polluters because it burns coal using fossil fuel, especially in the winter months. You can see the coal being dropped off at restaurants, south side, stacks of coal. Uh, you would see uh, a lot of uh, uh, little uh, truckloads of coal being dumped at places, residences, apartments. But, you know, I've been here 50 years. You don't see that anymore, Jay. You don't see coal here. Maybe the only coal you see are Americans who are expats here doing a barbecue on the weekend. Maybe that's <laughs> all we do see coal. Well, what do they use instead of coal to keep warm? I'm sure it's still cold in China in the winter, but what do they use? Well, I think the China is getting away from fossil fuel. You know, they're looking at alternative energy. But, you know, one of the things that has been very important here, at least in Beijing, has been a major move to really uh, clamp down on Beijing, um, the polluters in Beijing. Uh, first of all, the last coal burning plant in the city has been closed down. Now, you, they use alternative energy because the way Beijing is set up, when Beijing was designed uh, back actually in the modern era in the 70s, investors came to China, they smartly dug the underground. And you know, there's underground grids, water pipes around the whole city. So the whole city will be uh, pumped in hot, warm water, steam. So the city's pretty warm. And in fact, in the apartments, the residences, the office buildings, you know, water goes through these pipes and, and they have it prepared so that on November 16th, that's the official day, that the, the heat gets turned on, that warm water, and it, it generates heat 
in offices and homes. So, you know, they've got that under control. But the biggest thing is, is that they're, they're cracking down on the polluters. Um, they're closing down factories within the city area. So things have, have markedly made a change, you know. You measure pollution by the air quality index. It's an international standard. So a few years ago, all the American expats would be looking at the AQI on our iPhones, and it tells us just what the air quality index is. So we would know how bad the air is outside. But Beijing has done a lot of things to take corrective action. Well, is there a big move in China to, um, you know, uh, avoid pollution? I mean, where is it coming from? It sounds like um, well, when you say crackdown, you use words like that, it sounds like it's a political initiative and uh, the government is uh, taking affirmative steps. Am I right? Well, you know, I, I, I found living in China, when they say they're going to do something, the government does it, um, and which, is, which is a miracle. You know, with, with 1.3 billion people, you know, it moves, okay. Uh, for example, last year, um, the government increased their budget by 23 to 25 percent just in environmental protection and energy efficiency, added about 35 billion renminbi to their budget just to attack that. And in Beijing alone, um, they have put companies on a watch list. They've got 170 companies on a watch list where they do daily inspections to check to see are these polluters, you know, just what the daily level pollution they're putting out. And there are fines for this. So there's a lot of things that are going on. They're doing a hands-on approach to actually clamp down on the pollution. Um, and I can see that it's happening. I was at dinner last night with the, the Dutch businessman, and he said, I was here two years ago, and I didn't talk about the show, but he said, you know, there's something different. It's cleaner. What are they doing here? And so we had this whole discussion, and I talked about our show today, about what they're doing here in China to crack down the pollution. Now, it's, 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 it's very visible because um, in 2013, that was the apocalypse year in China. That's the year the pollution shot up to 755 on the air quality index. When it shoots up to 500, that's danger. 700 is deadly. At level 300, the skies are all gray. So it was common a few years ago, 2 o'clock, I'd be sitting out in Guomao, China World Tower, looking outside, and Jay, everything is like pitch gray and black. It looked like it was like 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening mm. when it was 2 p.m. Mm. And today, that's not the case. So it's having a good effect. Um, but, but, you know, tell me, what, what happens? I mean, what kind of instruction... What kind of, what do you call it, crackdown instruction would I get from the government um, uh, in order to, you know, improve the air? What would the government be telling me to do? Well, you know, they've, they've done several things. First of all, for the, the number of registered car drivers here in the city on a daily, every day, it's 5 million. So they have a system where they crack down the number of drive users. Okay, for example, on certain days, if your license plate ended with an odd number, you only could drive on certain days. Mm. You couldn't drive, and people have to take the bus. People have to use mass transit. So I've seen that that has a major effect. Mm. Um, people using the subway more. Uh, people getting around uh, alternative energy vehicles. Like in the previous show, we talked about Mobike, and we talked about all these uh, bike sharing. People ride them during the winter. I ride them all the time. Um, they're cheap. They're, they're a great way to get around, and it's healthy. Yeah, what guess, about uh, it, danger? Not, Can you, if you ride on the street, uh, how, how likely is it somebody's going to hit you from behind, either with, um, you know, a, a car or maybe a truck or maybe another bicycle? Well, you know, I, I think that that was something that everybody, as Westerners, expats, Ford cigarettes, they might be, especially if they come to Beijing for the first time, you're a little bit scared, you don't know the rules. There are certain protocols here. Because a city that is so large where business has to move, when you're at an intersection, you just don't walk when it says walk. You wait for the cars to go. And then everybody masses up to about 100, 50 to 100. And there's usually a guy in the corner who says, okay, group, you're okay. And everybody hands across. It's like a sheep crossing. It's a cattle crossing, Jay. So there are rules of etiquette. So I'm not saying I have to look at the eyes of a Chinese, not a Westerner. And this is how things done, because you know, with one three point billion people, with 
22 million people a day in Beijing. You know, if you had to do the Western way, where we stop, we have to let the pedestrians, or they let us cross half the street before they can make that right turn. Everything stops there. Everything stops commerce and dead. So there's a little different rules of engagement, but it works here. Mm -hmm. So suppose but, I don't follow the instruction that I get from Xi Jinping and the various divisions and departments and, and officials that may tell me what to do. What happens to me? Do I go to jail? Do I go to a re-education camp somewhere deep in the south? Where do I go? Oh, no, you're, you're thinking 50 years ago. You, there's actually fines. You get a fine. The polluters are fined. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things that I'm impressed about China is how they run this place with so many people, how you can create order. There is law and order. I'll give you an example. Um, the, the, the way the culture is, um, for example, part of this, is this, this pollution crackdown means that China has turned to green energy. And we're seeing a lot of green energy initiatives. For example, the university where I teach, there are actually notices where they put on all the dorms, all the office buildings, um, that they're doing this green movement. So you can't ride your electric bikes in the, uh, you can't keep it parked in certain areas because now they prefer you to use bicycles. And people have switched to bicycles. So again, there is a conscious effort, not only from the level of the factory, the businesses, but down to the everyday mm. persons, okay? Mm. This, green, this green movement. But you know what's interesting is, is how technology is, is used and harnessed. Like this show is talking about technology. For example, in China, the policemen who monitors the traffic on the road, they are serious about cars who try to take over the road, who park in areas on the street where they're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't send a tow truck. There, there is a policeman who comes around who has his mobile phone, who has an application. He takes a picture of that car in the license plate, sends it back to on their computer service, and then all of a sudden, he, that goes into uh, their computer center. There's an infraction lodged. And so he just prints out on a small thermal printer the actual ticket, the ticket right there. And so the, the printer is only, only the size the printer comes out. And he, he just sticks it on the car. And the, the registrant is, is sent to notice that he owes a fine, that there's a parking violation. And they're serious because if you have so many of these violations, it counts against you. Um, and when you try to register your car again, um, you may have problems. They may, <laughs> they may forbid you from driving. So, so good behavior results. What about that the fine you talked about? I mean, just uh, let's see. An, an RMB is worth what uh, fifteen cents, sixteen cents. So how many uh, how many yes. how many RMB do I get fined if I say park in the wrong place or I violate uh, you know some directive about uh, you know pollution? Well, Jay, I don't drive a car in China, so I never <laughs> smart. I never look at the fines, but I, I understand the fines can be very substantial. Mm. Um, so technology is used to keep people thinking about uh, following the rules. You know, when you have this many people, 1.3 billion people, you have to use technology. So it, it goes back to another point. You know, again, back in the states, maybe if 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 the police use that kind of technology. You know, they can do use their time for greater other important things and get the job efficiently done. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a better you idea than, than towing the car all the time. But you know, I wanna I wanna yeah. I wanna change our viewpoint to the whole the you know, the green initiative in China. You know, uh, last my last trip there, um, my wife and I were coming down the Yangtze River in a in a riverboat and we were surrounded by coal barges. And the coal was coming from the hinterland to Shanghai in that case. Um, you know, enormous amounts of coal. And the, the country was, you know, living on coal. So where are the solar panels? Do you see them? If you stood up in your coffee shop and walked out in the street, would you be able to see solar panels? Would you be able to see wind? Uh, I mean, wind turbines, what would, you, what would you see? And what is driving this? Because obviously, if they're still using coal, they're going to have pollution. So they must be using something else, and they must be more advanced than they were. 
You know, when the last time I checked, uh, there weren't that many solar panels actually being in, in use in China, although they were ramping up their production of solar panels. Uh, where do you see them? Well, Jay, that's a good question. Um, I think the Chinese are um, looking at how to harness this solar power energy um, into solar plants, which not, do not necessarily have to be right in the middle of the city. As you know, it could be at the outside of the city. Um, I understand that China has um, actually, um, in certain, for example, certain cities have huge solar farms that's outside the city. Mm -hmm. And that solar farm is converted into uh, energy that was sent, sent in, transmitted back into the metropolitan area. Um, and I know for sure that, um, that they're switching off the coal because this year, the last coal burning plant in Beijing was closed down this year. In fact, it was about a month ago, it was closed down. So they're not using coal. No more coal in so Beijing. Energy, no more coal in Beijing. And that's I think that's, that's something. Difference. You know, and, and I think we have to look because um, China has always been the largest coal consumer. But in 2016, uh, China accounted for 25% of the total $329 billion investment in, in new energy investment, in renewable mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I think they're taking... Um, Possible other steps, you know. As you know, the U.S. not signed the Paris Accord, uh, and China is taking that opportunity to to um, put money back into renewable energy research, um, um, creating renewable energy. And one of their projects, they understand, is One Belt One Road, which commerce will go through Middle China up through the Northwest, up through the uh, Middle East, and up to Europe. And so one of the things that China is proposing to do is to create in those areas a lot of renewable energy, which can be transmitted across borders. And, and, and feed it back to China. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and so that's very interesting. So it's going to be a corridor where energy can pass through mm. and goods will pass through. So, um, you know, you need energy to, to make commercial centers, you know, trade. So that's a big priority. So they're doing a lot of things. Russell, we're going to take a short break, if you don't mind, and then we're going to come back and uh, we're going to talk more about renewable energy in China. Uh, we're going to talk more about their aspirations and goals. We have goals. Maybe they have goals, too. Right now, we're going to, have, we're going to take a goal of one minute for uh, our uh, public service announcement break. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all uh, these Russell, DJs can you hear me? and producers are set up all around yes, the Yes, hi, Jay. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what it is, but we're hearing music. Guys. We're hearing all kinds of uh, interruption noises. What's going on in the right. coffee shop? It's, it's, you know, this is a coffee shop, and there's just music in the background here. No. I'm, I'm fortunate, fortunate to have that music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of played some really nice sounds. I like this music. So we do it. Okay. Okay, it's Monday, the four o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Asia with Russell Yu, who joins us by Skype uh, from Beijing. And we're talking about renewable energy in China, really important. I remember when we started the, um, I guess it was the lawyer exchange program in downtown Honolulu, the lawyers who were over here were really interested in the fact that we had so much renewable energy. And uh, their idea was to carry some of that knowledge, technology, um, you know, the, the whole initiative word about it back to China because China was hungry for that and wanted to get into renewable energy. And the manufacture of renewable energy, uh, you know, elements like, like uh, solar panels. Now, um, China is doing a lot of solar panels. I wonder if they're doing a lot of wind also, Russell. Do you see uh, wind turbines anywhere? Have you heard about that? I see wind turbines all over China, um, not in cities, but outside the cities, on mm -hmm. mountains, in rural areas uh, where there is renewable energy 
um, and created by wind power. Mm -hmm. Huge, you know, wind power plants. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think, you know, the fact is that um, China is is increasing, the, in putting a lot of money, you know, in the solar farms, uh, solar production, in um, wind turbines. You know, they're they're making a, a major blitz to 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 um, uh, invest in that area. Um, from what I understand is that the um, China leadership um, has uh, put in roughly about they're th investing three hundred sixty-seven billion dollars in the next three years on these renewable energy power development. Mm -hmm. So, what so percentage are you in, at now? Hydro. Now, you know, in Hawaii, we're supposed to be a hundred percent renewable energy by twenty forty-five. Other places I've heard about in Europe, you know, they're kind of ahead of us in that regard. Uh, and, I, and I wonder uh, whether there is a public aspiration, a public goal in China to reach 100% uh, renewable energy either in Beijing or a city or a province or the whole country by a certain date. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that China is looking, you know, over a picture probably over the next 30 years, from what I understand, to, to make the complete switch over. Um, you know, that's why it's investing a lot of money. This country is huge. Um, and I think that, um, again, um, the opportunity takes itself because of the Paris Accord, you know, mm -hmm. carbon trade credits, sure. all of this. So, so, so things are happening for China. Um, and from what I understand is, is that, you know, they've already canceled, uh, recently I just read that they've canceled the 100 coal-fired power stations, switching mm -hmm. to large solar farms, mm -hmm. okay? You know, one interesting that, thing that's happening uh, in the U.S. and not Hawaii uh, is liquid natural gas, LNG. And, um, you know, Hawaii kind of had the chance to do that, but uh, Governor Ige kind of quashed it a couple of years ago with a public statement that he didn't like it. Um, the Hawaii Gas uh, was trying to get that through. I think uh, Hawaiian Electric was probably also interested in it. Um, but right now, there's really no liquid natural gas in Hawaii, and I, 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 don't, I don't see a big prospect for it here. On the other hand, on the mainland, liquid natural gas is a big deal. There's lots of it, a, a supply that will last a long time. Uh, it's coming from various places on the mainland and also from Canada. Um, and in fact, this administration is trying to negotiate deals through Japan to provide liquid, nat liquid natural gas to other places in Asia because it's cheap and it burns relatively clean, even if it's a fossil fuel. But I wonder if there's any talk about LNG in China, whether China is negotiating for part of the uh, American supply of LNG that's supposed to come through Japan. Have you heard anything about that? Well, I haven't heard too much about liquid natural gas, okay? One of the things that you've got to think about is if we don't have to, buy liquid natural gas. We can create our solar energy. Why would we need to buy liquid natural gas? We become really hostage to somebody else. It's sort of like where U.S. has, has become hostage to the deal. We need oil from the Middle East. And look what we ended up going into war and so forth because we're fighting over oil. Strategic position, strategic interest. But I think in the U.S. Uh, and how it relates to Hawaii, we've got to really carefully look at the, at the numbers, you know? For example, um, in 2016 in the U.S., the solar energy made up 39% of new electricity generation capacity in the U.S. It increased it, okay? And yet, um, we are seeing a lot of pushback in the U.S. where um, President Trump has, is advocating fossil fuel, okay? And recently, there's a, a controversy because they're bringing uh, some um, uh, trading uh, uh, violation against China uh, for the uh, manufacturing of solar panels. It's too cheap, okay? Um, but, you know, the fact of it is that U.S. has only a 2% market in the world of manufactured solar panels. So why is it a big issue? It's not a big industry in the U.S. In fact, the bigger industry in the U.S. is actually in the solar energy where we should be concentrating on that. Um, in 2016, um, coal declined by 53% in the megawattage uh, coming from coal. Natural gas was increased by 33%, but solar power, um, the jet generation of megawatts was increased by 5,000% in the U.S. So you can see the trend, the direction is towards solar energy. 
Um, I, I know that natural gas is important, but again, solar energy is, is probably the area where maybe in the U.S. we're starting to back away from. Um, um, so again, um, in 2016, 39% um, of new electricity was generated by solar industry. Um, 30,000 jobs are created in the solar energy industry. And these jobs um, were a lot higher. There were 374,000 jobs created in the solar industry in the U.S. as compared to 160,000 jobs for the coal industry. Mm. So we're, we're, we all of a sudden we're backing away from the greatest potential in the U.S. to deal with the solar energy industry. And it's not the manufacture of solar panels in the U.S. It's the servicing. It's the repair. It's the operational aspect. The service and where the new jobs are created. So, um, again, that there's a lot of questions there, Jay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, as I said back a few years ago, not too many, maybe ten. Uh, China was not really manufacturing a lot of solar panels. Now, it has ramped up its production to be the world leader, I think, in manufacturing solar panels and, and quality solar panels. Um, and of course, it can use those itself, and it sounds like it is. It's moving to a, a solar electric um, you know, energy economy. Uh, and it certainly wants to sell them in the U.S. That's a great market for it. But we have these tariff issues. Um, and Washington is imposing tariffs on solar panels. And I wonder you know, what the talk is about that. Uh, it's, it's problematic. Maybe it's still in play. I don't know. But my understanding is that the tariffs are really hard. The American tariffs are really hard on the Chinese solar panels. Yes, Jay. I think that's the, the that's the uh, trade dispute that is starting to develop at this point in time. The proposal to smack China heavy tariffs. Again, there may be some political dimensions there that you and I I, I don't want to speculate. Um, but it, it, there was a lot of pushback, not from the China side, but from the U.S. side, mm -hmm. where the experts are saying that that doesn't make sense that we should be putting those tariffs because U.S. manufactures only a small percentage of these solar panels. And the dispute arose because there was a Chinese subsidiary in the U.S. that went bankrupt. And the major creditor, I believe, or shareholder, some sort, brought that issue about the trade practices by China. Not the Chinese, uh, but it was the creditor or somebody who had an interest in that Chinese subsidiary that raised that. And so now they're going on a full frontal attack to, to seek heavy tariffs on China. Right? But the question is that it may be something where it's actually hurting the U.S. because the U.S. cost of manufacturing is too great. The key to the Americans would be developing the technology piece that runs those solar things. Okay, U.S. has the patents for those. Again, that's the key where the money should be put in the R&D, the new technology, and then the servicing side where you create a lot of new jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not the manufacture of the hardware piece. Yeah. That's something that that doesn't make sense here. One other thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, on this show, um, some years ago, it must be maybe three, four years ago, we had a young American couple from New York City, as a matter of fact, that went into uh, a smaller city in China to teach English. You know, that was, I guess it still is a, an attractive situation for them. And uh, the, the, the wife, the spouse who maintained the household in this city, um, had a terrible time in, in, in cleaning the coal dust off, uh, you know, her pottery and her kitchen, you know, utensils and so forth. Her whole house was covered every day with coal dust. And she cleaned it, and the next day would be covered with coal dust again. And it was really trouble. In fact, uh, at the end of the, the, end of the, of the throw, they, they quit. They left, which is not so easy if you're in a contract to teach. Uh, and, and, they, and they came back to Beijing where they... They found it was the situation was better. My question, though, is what about these smaller cities? You say that Beijing uh, is benefiting by the solar and renewable energy. Uh, what about the smaller cities where coal is the mainstay, where everything that's happening in the city is coal? Sure, they knock off the, you know, the last coal plant in Beijing, but what about all those other cities? There's a lot of other hundreds of millions of people in China. Are they enjoying the benefit of this renewable and, and this, uh, you know, uh, less polluted air? Well, I think, uh, Jay, this, this recognition of air pollution that the China government has taken notice is not just only of Beijing. 
it's all over the country. And yes, it's true, especially in the second tier cities, you know, where the uh, advances uh, in technology haven't been fully implemented. Um, but I see that there is a program that they're developing where some of the actual renewable energy farms are in rural areas. For example, there's a, there's a second tier city, I think it's called Huainan, where it's one of the largest, largest solar panel, panel um, farm in created China, where that renewable energy is gonna be pushed out, okay? Um, it is a problem because there's too many people, resources are limited. Now you've got hydropower in the, in the, in the north, in the areas where they have the uh, Yangtze River, where that was developed years ago. Um, and that has changed the area to some degree, okay? But again, these changes take a little time. Uh, and you know, I don't go off into the second tier cities, but I understand um, that the government has recognized this and they are trying to change the infrastructure, create new energy mm -hmm. sources mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from what I've seen is it has to be that direction because, you know, um, China has created um, uh, the infrastructure here to move a lot of things, like the trade, high-speed trade goes to all the cities, including the second-tier cities. With that comes investments back into these cities, mm -hmm. business, which means, again, the effects of pollution. It, it has to attack it the same way it has attacking Beijing. Yeah. You know, you mentioned early on about how the government, you know, when the government wanted to do something, like crack down on people who pollute, um, you know, it could do it. No problem at all. And it would happen, and there would be sanctions that would, you know, force people to comply. Um, but you know, um, I wonder about the comparison of the "not in my backyard" phenomenon that we see in Hawaii, where people uh, don't want uh, renewable energy in their backyard. Sometimes they oppose it, especially in the case of wind. Um, and on the mainland, the same thing happens, uh, where you know, through our um, we have a community, you know, meeting process. We have a lot of we have objections are expressed, and I wonder how that works in China. I mean, for example, if I went out on the street outside your coffee shop and asked people how they felt felt about renewable energy and solar and, and wind, uh, what would they say? They say they're behind it. Would they say they didn't care? Uh, would they say they opposed it in some circumstances? Um, and do you see protests? Uh, do you see, you know, I know China has plenty of protests. Do you see protests about the placement of solar energy or, or, or wind turbines uh, by people who don't like it in their backyard? You know, Jay, that's a question that could only come from a foreign perspective, okay? Because how they do things here, it's a cultural thing, okay? The why it's so different because to some extent, while China is transitioning to a rule of law society, it's still partly rule of man society. But it's not all bad because let's consider this. How did Singapore come out so well ahead of everybody in the back in Asia? It's because it's a rule of man society cloaked in rule of law. You had Liu uh, Kuan Yu, who was actually a benevolent dictator, um, and who, like in the Chinese mode, it's the Confucian way of how we run things. We have somebody who's benevolent that's going to make all these changes for the people. You know, the people here are struggling for the daily living to have a job, you know, um, China has moved 500 million people out of poverty. To do so meant that you've had to have somebody who's a strong figure who's going to, of course, uh, chart that path. And people accept it more here because that's the culture. It's the Confucian culture. Um, it's sort of like the group mentality collectively. We have to follow, but we have to trust this, you know. So again, I think that the government, I think the country, the people realize that we may be better off because we're seeing the effects of a changing society that's better. I can tell you something, Jay, all the roads in Beijing, even in the back streets, in areas you wouldn't think of, the roads are all new, there are no potholes. You're seeing, experiencing daily changes. Um, in this area where I live, they knocked down a lot of buildings that were even linked to business, to business squatters. They knock it down because it was a health and a um, dangerous the violation of the codes. So they're putting up new trees, um, new improvements, new structures. So all that's changing. So again, um, it's sort of like this different cultural concept. In the U.S., the rule of law means that we have a lot of these hearings, people invited. We have people coming out of the woodwork, and we have people who are special interest. And you and I, Jay, are lawyers, <clears throat> and we know the lawyers <clears throat> get involved in the picture. And the, the lawyers 
<clears throat> become a price of the, of the progress. The lawyers get paid. There's litigation. Things get stopped. At the end of the day, the, the great aspiration, the goals of this project are shot. There's no money. There is no money to fund it. And we start from square one, so nothing gets done. So the two different models are two different. There are cultural concepts that are totally different. And I'm talking from the eyes of the Chinese through their perspective of what they see. And I think they understand that. They understand that the, the culture is Confucianism. So we follow and we believe this is a group thing. And so they support it. You know, I used to say in the French, uh, plus ça change, uh, plus le même. Meaning, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <clears throat> I've changed my view of that. Now I say, plus ça change, plus ça change. It keeps on changing ever faster. And to close, Russell, could you tell our viewers how you say that in, in Mandarin? Well, I don't think it was saying it in Mandarin, but I would say this. What I was saying is two words. One is mei banfa. Mei banfa means we can't do much about this. And the other word is kai. Kai means we can do everything. And I think that attitude pervades here. We can do everything. And so that's what I've seen in the last 15 years I'm here. So it has changed just for the better. Thank you, Russell. Xie Xie, Sai Jin, great to talk to you. We'll be back with more from Russell Yu in a week or two on ThinkTech Asia. Aloha.